I am not thief. I am a businessman. Welcome to my news on point, your pulse on trending news. Subscribe to our channel. You guys contribute largely to crude oil thefts, and then the nation is losing so much of its wealth. For me, I am not thief. What about those that are using vessels, mother vessels from the ocean, loading? I am just taking a little jerry cans. This is jerry can. For whatever I am seeing there, those are saying this. They are using biro to thief. They are the people even contributing from those bunkers. Our own, this is not bunker. We are just doing, we are supplying uh, kerosene to the filling station. No filling station, no place they have kerosene. And the government does not matter. What about the north? They are doing their gold, doing this. What, they, what would they call those people? Okay, those people are not thief. Because when the poor man do, they say thief. But when the rich man do, they call embezzlement. There is no job in this Nigeria. Ninja Delta, we are suffering. Since we are suffering, this oil is our own. What if the federal government, you know, makes an attempt to employ you? Would you quit this job? What kind of job do they want to employ me for first? This thing I'm doing is okay for me. It's okay to my people. The people that are given job now, most of them now, today they have not paid them. Uh, university lecturers, they are on strike. They want to give me a job. What kind of is it the job you give me then you not pay me? We don't care whether we die. Like me, I don't care. The whole of Nigeria, you cannot see kerosene to buy. We, the Niger Delta boys, are the one producing kerosene and supplying the filling station. If you give us the opportunity, we will do more. Then they say they want to stop bunkering. How? Are they giving out job? Look, uh, Ayo, I, I refer, I said this several times, so have you and Dr. Abati. You, in order to fight terrorism, you need intelligence. Uh, yeah, we get all what's been going on. They keep commemorating this, commemorating that. You also need money. Taylor Swift's concert, I think it was in Vienna, was called off because intelligence had found out that it was going to be a terrorist attack before her show. Before Russia had that terrible terrorist attack at the concert center where gunmen went and shot the place up, the U.S. intelligence told them it was going to happen before it did. They, didn't, they ignored it and then it happened. Intelligence, intelligence, intelligence. That is what we need to invest in. And we should be able to, I'm going to bring up removing money from fuel subsidies, 6.8 trillion. You can invest that in your security apparatus and improve your intelligence. That is what we need to do. Because if we don't improve on our security, it will deter investment. We had our gentleman from South Af the um, travel agency yesterday okay. that was talking about traveling to South Africa. Um, off air, Rufai was talking about why do we do this in Nigeria? And you mentioned insecurity, right? So yeah. these are the things that impact um, the economy, we have to invest in intelligence, intelligence, intelligence to thwart these attacks. So if we don't, these things, you know, these things are still going to continue. Investment in, uh, in security, in uh, technology as well. We'll fire your take on the story. I mean, I, so it's a multi-pronged approach. Intelligence is just one of them. And I don't think the problem is that we, we don't have intelligence. We do have intelligence, but how do we act on it? You are in a country where most of the security architectures do not shake hands properly. When there's an intelligence that comes through, what is done, how is the intelligence processed? There are many layers that disperses the intelligence off because of all sorts of interests. That's number one. So we have very good guys on the ground. And here I'd like to pay tribute to the soldiers that lost their lives in the fight against terrorists recently. Very sad one. I mean, their memories never be forgotten. But when you get intelligence, then how do you then go ahead? You'll be surprised to know that most of the receptionists you see in hotels are DSS officials. And they're getting details here and there. So you have people walking around everywhere. And the officials gathering intelligence and all of that. So in fact, some of them even work in companies. But the truth is, how do we not cascade intelligence? Then secondly, you need heavy military spending. To be able to secure our African borders, the military cost is put at over one to two billion. And I'm using that prorating the cost France spent on Operation Bakan every year. Our standing troops, how do you equip them? What kind of weaponry do they have? Because warfare has gone technological today. Look at Ukraine. Ukraine is not getting into Russia with bayonets and horses. Using drones. They're using drones. They're using Bayraktar, smaller drones that are being made by Turkey. And that's how they're getting their targets. 
they're using surveillance cameras they're infiltrating network ecosystems and things like that so you also need to add to that technology and concerning that technology that technology should be built locally i believe there are young people in nigeria that can build better technologies than the israelis are building i believe in the nigerian youth and the software system how can we harness them yes daikon is doing some good work again to the military intelligence kudos to them and the armament factory that's a daikon People like Profos are doing a good work, but we also need to get a lot of young people in defense hackathons and get them in. Thirdly, improving our image abroad. That's another one. Because if you don't improve your image abroad, then how are you able to be able to show that Nigeria has an authority to stamp? Then most importantly, the greatest form of security and enter banditry is economic security. You cannot have folks that are very poor and hungry out in the North and other parts of this country and expect things to, to work. The economy is in quagmire. People hardly have food to eat. There was a research done in the 80s after we had the Metasani riots that if the hopelessness of the hunger is not addressed in the north, it's going to cascade into something bigger. That was in the 80s, close to 40 years ago. What was done after the yeah. Metasani riots? I mean, I keep quoting that report. The shutdown on the textile factories, I've not been able to get a very empirical proof, but I can hazard a guess that the shutdown of the textile factories also led to the increase in insecurity. So are we going to get the textile factories back in the north? You had the likes of NASCO employing thousands of people in the north back in the days. So where are we getting this factory and productivity back? So in case we do, if, if we do not do all of this, then we'll have people that can easily swell to banditry and all of that. So give the kids job, give them food to eat, give them education. And we also need to look at our cultural systems. In the long run, when you have a system that deprives children from education, then it's going to cause a problem and it's going to be a, a blowback on the state. So we must encourage kids to go to school because everything feeds into in the, the insecurity architecture in the country. But most importantly, the commander in chief and his willingness to call a spade a spade and stand for justice. The last part of this fighting insecurity and banditry is the rule of law. Till today, the people that their names were mentioned out of Dubai and they were terrorist financiers, what has been done to them? So it's as if there's a law for some and others can violate the law. You live in a country where people like Yaya Belu is being forced to go to the court and other people are easily arrested. Do you think people will take the country seriously? So for the fact that some people are still higher than the law, then it breeds an air of insecurity. You live in a country where people came on television threatening other people and the police are de defending them. But you forget in a hurry that if other people did that same thing in this country, they'll be in jail in the next minute. The Igbo man that said all sorts of incendiary words was taken to jail the next minute. The man that said the Yanke, Yakilichi or Nkechi, I forgot the name now, nah, Yachukudi, was left to go just like that. I said was joking. For good measure, he's even written a book. Yes, they would like to read his book. Interesting. All right, so just to um, emphasize some points, because you mentioned you know i was going to address the non-kinetic address um, non-kinetic efforts towards tackling terrorism because you've spoken about the fact that we must invest in technology we must invest and increase the budget of the military and security operatives and also in, in saying that also that money should go to the welfare of our service of our servicemen because we talk about this a lot of times and so one of the greatest honors you can do to soldiers or the fallen heroes is to ensure that those who are left behind are well taken care of and that their family members who also are left behind are taken care of. I believe that's one of the greatest honors. It's not just for us to have speeches and come on a day like this and, and extol their virtues, but to ensure that we put our money where our mouth is. So where we extolling their virtues, we also ensure that they are well funded and well looked after. I have to emphasize that. So those uh, soldiers who have fallen, especially on the 26th of August, who had passed away as a result of the terrorist attack on the United Nations building in Abuja, what is the fate of their family members? Are they being looked after? We've heard cases of uh, widows or family members of fallen heroes or fallen soldiers who are asked to leave the barracks without notice and are thrown, you know, are, are left in, 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 a, in a very bad state. And so this is an opportunity to advocate for them that when we hold um, um, conferences like this, meetings like this, there must be a show of actions towards the family members of those who are left behind. Now, I'm going away from that, let me talk about the non-kinetic part of things because I believe that, as you mentioned, Rufai, one of the strongest ways to fight terrorism is to deal with the drivers of terrorism. If you don't deal with it, then what we'll be doing is that we're being um, reactive as opposed to being proactive. So what are some of the drivers as we notice? I, rem I recall 
Following the um, terrorist, 77 terrorist bombing in the United Kingdom, beyond the strong stance and the, stance and the anti terrorism bill, what was also a lot of money also went into community activation and community projects, especially targeting areas where uh, members of the black and minority ethnic groups. Um, gathered around because a number of people saw that these were people who were influenced, especially those from the Middle East, by forces there to carry out attacks. Aside from the intelligence they gathered, by the way, intelligence is not just gathered for information. Intelligence is supposed to be gathered to be used to either prevent the action from taking place or to minimize the action. I say this because, um, and I, I'll come back to my uh, my talk on the on community action. I say this because let's take a case in point. What happened with the recent um, protests? We had news prior to the time that the security operatives had received intelligence about a possible hijack of this protest. What one would think is that there would be efforts made to, you know, to mitigate these um, you know, actions or perhaps these plans by hijackers. That's what intelligence is supposed to do. That's what a risk assessment is supposed to do, not just to be aware of or to announce the risk, but to actually you know, um, arrange ways or um, find solutions to be able to address or mitigate. Unfortunately, what we see again and again is that we have these big announcements and the thing still happens. So what is the point of intelligence? And so the issue is not the amount of money spent or the, the technical expertise on intelligence. It's available. We have partnerships with international organizations. We have partnerships with the United States of America, with the United Kingdom. They train our personnel. We have strong intelligence. The, the, what then happens is what we do with intelligence. So moving away, now moving back to my conversation on investment in community-led action. Was it, they said to do projects, meet, you know, catch them young, the people who could potentially be, um, you know, be enticed into terrorism were paid attention to. They invested a lot of money. I, I know this because I worked in that sector and they put a lot of money into community-led activity to keep the young people occupied and away from a life of crime on enticement into crime. We have to look into that. And we can see what happened during the protest to give us a marker as some of the areas that we should flag as red red flag areas. The North has been in conversation in recent times and it's something that we cannot or we can no longer bury our heads in the sand over. And that is talking about the fact that we have to invest in infrastructure in the North. If we don't invest in infrastructure, ensure that they go back to school, ensure that we're able to tackle poverty in these vulnerable areas, we expose them to being enticed by radicals who want to radicalize them into um, a life of crime and terrorism. So we must look at that. Look at the um, agriculture. So it's a, it's a circle. They're not able to go into their farms as a result of banditry. But who are the bandits themselves? And then when we have state governors who are shielding and protecting and giving, uh, giving amnesty programs that don't seem to do the work, instead almost seems like they're shielding a life of criminality. We're not going to get anywhere. So the, the president has shown, and he's, he did make a um, statement yesterday, has demonstrated a commitment to tackling terrorism. And he made a good point that Nigeria alone cannot handle this. It takes global effort. And I believe that with regards to that, countries must come together first from, the, from an African-led approach and then collaborating with the international, international world. But um, I, I hope that this will not just be a talk shop, but they will take this further to strategizing and finding out ways to handle the situation, particularly in the north and areas where there are vulnerable youths or vulnerable population who are susceptible to being enticed into a life of crime and criminality.